Yeah. First, I want to apologize for uh, canceling uh, the teachings last month, uh, short term, like just like I think one day before. Uh, so what happened uh, was that um, my teacher for 30 years suddenly uh, passed away. And uh, my initial response was shock. Uh, so I was um, close to Lama Sopa Rinpoche and uh, have been guided quite closely for 20 years, not so much the last 10 years. But then it was so surprising. And then on Friday, I was still in shock. And um, yeah, I felt um, I, I, I felt uh, not like uh, teaching on Saturday. I could have done it because then on Saturday, I, the shock passed and gratefulness was there. Uh, so the, the initial shock released, but maybe it was good. Um, so, but now I'm here. And um, I'm not a tra trauma therapist, uh, neither am I a scholar of karma. Uh, so uh, I'm more interested in experience and meditation. Um, but uh, last year, I was supposed to give a weekend on the teachings on karma. And before, and I have been interested in the topic of trauma for a few years. And just reading what is kind of available resources, which maybe some of you are familiar to, like The Body Keeps the Score and the work of Gabo Mate. And also I attended some online uh, teachings with Thomas Hübel around collective trauma. <clears throat> So I probably don't know more about trauma uh, than some of you. But uh, where, uh, during these teachings on karma, uh, I suddenly saw there's quite an overlap. And uh, so between the teachings which I get in the Galuk tradition around karma and what I've learned about trauma, so during that weekend, I just started to bring the teachings on trauma into, into the traditional teachings of karma. And so that's why how this topic arose for me. Um, and um, so I'm just exploring as you, so don't take anything for granted. And if I say something really stupid, uh, then, uh, then please uh, raise your hand uh, and and uh, correct, yeah, because it's uh, 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 for me also like uh, just a work in progress, and nothing what I say is like set in stone or is the final answer. Probably more questions than answer. What I'm always, uh, what I always have been interested in, I. I started teaching around 15 years ago, mainly in the organization of my teacher, Lama Sopa Rinpoche, the FPMT, the Foundation for Preservation for the Mayana Tradition. So what I'm always have been interested because I have a background in psychology, I studied clinical psychology and I trained as a Gestalt therapist. I never really worked as a therapist uh, because after I finished my training, I went to India and then I became a monk. Uh, but that's uh, the background I have. So what I always uh, am interested in is to uh, explore how to uh, bring the traditional Tibetan Buddhist teachings. My background is mainly Tibetan Buddhist uh, into the West, into the Western psyche, so that it actually lifts us up and uh, makes us uh, traveling lighter through life. And my observation is different. So I see people uh, kind of, uh, you could say that, almost like re-traumatized by some aspects of the teachings, at, at least in the way they are presented. So I have been from the beginning, like really trying to 
find ways to guide the meditation, teach ritual, uh, translate uh, the teachings on karma, you know, for example, with the health and uh, so that uh, the teachings lands in us uh, without uh, triggering shame, guilt, and the feeling of not being good enough. Um, so that has been always my, my interest. And I also have a bit of uh, experience or knowledge uh, about the Thai forest tradition. Uh, so I have close friends, also monks in the Thai forest tradition. And before I met the Tibetan tradition, I practiced in that tradition. So, and also there I observe, it doesn't happen so often, uh, I observe that uh, people who uh, come out from retreat, where you would expect, you know, you come out from retreat and you travel lighter, at least for a few days, there's more space, more kindness, that actually some people, they emerge from retreat, uh, again, you could say re-traumatized, yeah? feeling, uh, feeling overwhelmed but by what has happened and being destabilized. Uh, by uh, by by the practice, so that's where my interest into this uh, into this topic also comes from. And I would like to start with a meditation. Um, and uh, what I want to emphasize in this meditation is a very important point in uh, working with pain, working with difficult emotions. And it's also important in the work with trauma. And that is uh, to create a safe space. Uh, to have an entry protocol for your practice, uh, which creates a safe space or a sacred space in which you feel safe. Because uh, healing of trauma or healing of karma means that uh, we bring our body into our practice and we respond to that which is difficult in simple words, with love, with kindness. Yeah. And uh, in the Tibetan tradition, there's a lot of emphasis on the entry protocol. So you're not just sitting down and then watching your breath or something. So you slide into your practice uh, with certain maybe prayers or uh, invitations, so you create a place, a safe place, where you can just be. And that's what I would like us to do. And uh, here in this group, um, it's special for me because uh, there's three people here, I know, or four people. So it's a, it's a new Sangha for me. So I have no idea who you are. I mean, you are a human being and you have feelings and you struggle so much I know <laughs> and you want to be loved. I mean, that's quite a lot. Yeah. So, uh, so there is that level where we are just human beings uh, and I can uh, um, uh, acknowledge that and connect with that level. But uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm a bit nervous. Yeah. So because it's a new situation for me, and uh, and you, most of you are American, uh, so that's also a different culture. Uh, so I'm 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 aware of that. I have a bit of experience. I have been teaching in the FPMT Center in New York, the Shanti Deva Center, for two years now. So I I have a bit of a sense, but I just feel more safe in a European context, yeah, because that's. Uh, it is like that. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good place for me to be because um, 
uh, I will uh, create a safe space for me. Uh, and because I'm the space holder, um, then uh, uh, then uh, I invite you into that, uh, into that safe space, that sacred space. Uh, so I'm I'm guiding. I'm I'm I will um, I will show you uh, how I, in my own practice and right now, create a sacred safe space. And maybe some of the things I will invite you doesn't mean much. Maybe could be. So you just let that go, uh, and then you just take from uh, from my guidance whatever feels good for you basically something you want to uh, want to let in yeah and I'm aware it's quite um, um, I mean it's quite an honor that uh, to sit here and uh, guide a meditation and feel that you trust so much that you at least sit here with me and you listen to what I'm saying. Uh, and maybe some, um, some, some things I say actually touch you. And uh, yeah, that's my, my invitation. Maybe there's a possibility for you to be touched. Yeah. So I invite you to be here as a feeling human being, not only as a thinking human being. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, take our seats. Um, um, You don't need to sit in a in a meditation posture, but uh, if that supports you, most important thing is that you feel comfortable. And maybe after some time, it feels good to close your eyes. If you keep your eyes open, they, they are relaxed without particularly looking at something. And then let's take some moments to just be here, adjusting your posture. And just noticing how you sit. And then you allow a shift to happen from the head into the body. Just noticing the felt sense of your body as it is. It's like shifting gear from the thinking mode and doing mode uh, to being, you know, being in present moment awareness. And the breath is an ally in this shift, not as the main meditation object, but it's a bit of a anchor. So with the in-breaths, there can be a sense of sliding 
or dropping into the body. And maybe it feels good to deepen the breath a little. And then with the out breath, there can be a bit of release, of letting go. And welcoming the guests in the guest house of the body through breath and awareness. How is the inner weather? And noticing without doing anything, just noticing. And breathing into. And thoughts, they continue to arise, but they become less important. And instead you emphasis, emphasize the sensations in the body, the more coarse sensations through the sitting, but also the more subtle sensations of your emotional body. the energy body. And then with the out breath, a possibility of softening the belly and softening the shoulders. And if you feel some discomfort or some tension, some tiredness in the felt sense of your body, we just give space for that. Just being here in present moment awareness. The past exists only in thoughts, the future exists only in thoughts. And this moment is what it is. And the invitation is to just be here. You have the permission to do nothing. And returning. So there's a bit of a doing uh, only when you get caught up in the radio station of the narrative self, the inner dialogue. And see if you can relax this notion that you are some, somewhere in your head like a ride on the horse. So if you relax that and you really slide into the body. The ground is carrying you. And you let yourself be carried. and returning, resting.
this being, being yourself, being loyal to what you bring into this moment. And welcoming or embracing with awareness and breath. Softening and opening. Letting be. And then I invite you to more consciously step into the temple, into the sacred space of our meeting, into the circle of Sangha, the spiritual friends, fellow travelers. And we can appreciate that this is a meeting between Scandinavian and European travelers and travelers from the United States. And we are in a miraculous way together. in this virtual sacred space. And even if we don't know superficial things about each other, everyone here is foremost a human being with feelings, just like you. And we all struggle. And uh, we all have experienced in different degrees, but we all have experienced developmental trauma. We are in pain. And uh, since we are here, all of us, we have a longing, a yearning, and an intuition that it is possible to travel lighter through our life. And it could be that uh, for the majority here, there's also a sense that we are doing this not only for ourselves. And so that is a beautiful intention binding us together. And let's uh, give an invitation to everyone from your heart.
So everyone is welcome, welcomed as, as you are. You just bring yourself along and you invite others, the others to do the same. Yeah. Another thing which is common between us is that we all are fundamentally innocent. You are. And we all have the capacity to love and uh, be loved. So Inside, deep inside, we are all unspeakable beautiful. Returning and resting, present moment awareness in the felt sense of your body. And thoughts are not important right now. So in this, uh, into this space of our meeting, into this virtual temple, if that makes sense for you, I would like to invite our mentors and teachers, maybe one common uh, ground here is uh, the Buddha, the awakened one, but I encourage you and invite you to call upon your angels, whatever they are, Buddhist or non-Buddhist. So I always invite Jesus, I'm a Catholic Buddhist, and of course my main teacher, Lama Sopa Rinpoche, and the Holiness of Dalai Lama, um, but um, Let's do every one of us and invite these angels uh, also for everyone else, even if, if they don't know the symbols or the people. So let's fill the space around us and between us uh, with uh, symbols of awake awareness. as if 
the sun, the morning sun is rising after a night of terror, after a night of loneliness and being cold. And the morning sun arises and we are sitting in the morning sun, bathing in the morning sun with our whole body. Uh, not only from the front, but all around, also from behind. And if you have a personal relationship to a master or a teacher or a therapist, a yoga teacher, You feel their presence, you, you see their eyes, you hear them, you hear their voice. And all of that is of course projections mental images, but they help us to make contact with these qualities inside of us. So feel into how it is. To be seen, to be looked through, and being loved. Just as you are. Though there is no hiding, you are completely naked. You can relax. Because you are safe. And whatever arises within you, pleasant and the unpleasant, sensations, feelings, thoughts, uh, they come and go. In that field of care, of kindness, of love, bathing, and returning and resting.
receiving. An opening. And emphasizing the felt sense of your body, the spacious aliveness of your body. Nothing to do, nothing to think about. Oh, and then the mentors, your teacher, or maybe Tara, the Buddha, whatever is meaningful for you dissolves. And their presence fills your body completely, every cell of your body, from the toes to the top of your head. particularly there where you are hot with yourself or where you're ashamed, where you feel stuck, where there's some tension. And you become aware of the Buddha within, the goddess within, the Jesus within the Dalai Lama within. And your heart opens like a lotus flower. And these qualities which you are aware of in your teachers, they start to pour out of your heart out of your essence, into your whole body, and then through the pores of your body, into this temple from heart to heart. And for a few moments, meditate for the others. Feel that you are here for the others. From, from the light within. And then radiating out into your surroundings where you are. As a source of light, as a source of healing from awake awareness within. And then you take your time. You have your eyes closed. You take your time to open them.
just appreciating how the experience is now for you. And again, if you could, uh, if it's possible to open your camera, that would be wonderful. And uh, and I can talk to human beings and not to black boxes. So this is so, so important. Yeah, Uh, um, creating a safe space. And uh, it might take some experimentation and some, uh, yeah, so it doesn't help to uh, learn a, a ritual or a kind of practice which doesn't speak to you. Uh, so take your time to explore and then uh, develop a, an entry protocol which fits you. Uh, to your uh, for your own personal practice so one um, I, I would like to start with uh, kind of uh, general um, introduction into karma very shortly and then uh, to make the connection to what we know about trauma so the teachings on karma describe how past experience shape the way we experience what is happening now So our past creates perceptual filters which makes us give meaning or see people and situations in our life in a certain way. So that's one thing, what you find in the teachings on karma. There is one uh, classic uh, metaphor in one of the Indian texts by Shandakirti, uh, who says something like, so you have a a glass with fluid and three kinds of beings look at this container with the fluid and uh, a hungry ghost sees a glass full of blood and pus, and it's disgusting. A god sees nectar, and the human being sees water. Yeah? So that's like the perceptual filter. Yeah? So in other words, we are disconnected from what is happening. We don't move beyond the past. We are not in touch with reality, but we have it's like glasses. Yeah? So we wear certain glasses and what we see is shaped by what we, what we have experienced before. We're disconnected. We're disconnected from what is actually happening in the situation. We see the people in the situations and now going more into a, a trauma approach, We see the people and the situations in our life 
based on our psychological history. We don't see the person. We don't see the situation. We are not in touch with what is happening in the present moment. And that's one part of the karma. But, uh, and the other is also the way we respond. So our reactivity, the way we respond is patterns uh, which we have developed as coping strategies in the past. So we repeat the same patterns. We react to our own projections in the way we have reacted before. So we are, we are reacting to the situation in, an, in a habitual way. There's a trigger and then there's a reactivity. So take a moment to reflect a little bit on that. Think about the difficult people in your life. And see how there's often situations where you lose connection with the different dimensions of that person. You have a certain image of that person. And probably we all have had experience that in our relationships that we notice it has something to do with the father or mother. And then we respond to that. So we sometimes get to a place where we can't move beyond the past. So both karma and trauma, you could say, is like a recurring circle of suffering. We do the same thing. And by doing the same thing, we create the conditions to experience the same thing. It's like a cycle. We respond to anger with anger and create more anger and see more anger. And uh, in the Buddhist teachings on karma, when that goes on and on in this circle, we end up in something which is called hell, yeah, where we only see anger and we respond only with anger, locked into that pattern of perception and reaction. So what we are invited to do, possibility of healing karma, healing trauma is to break that connection between trigger and reaction and replace unwholesome reactions with more wholesome reactions. So how to do that? And that's something I want to talk about. And then practice tomorrow with you. So in a way, shortly said, the trick is to stay in the felt sense of your body with the unpleasant experience, with the trigger, not in learning not to follow the reactive response and replacing the reactive response with something more wholesome. So that's how you purify karma. Purify karma 
purification is maybe not such a good word. I like to use healing. Yeah, purification has this connotation of like getting rid of something bad. Yeah, it's a healing. Uh, so there is this. Probably you have heard that. Instead of reacting, you respond. So you break this condition, this conditioned connection between trigger and reactivity by feeling your pain. That's the bad news. Because, I mean, <laughs> uh, what you want to heal, you need to feel. There is no way out except through. The way out is through. So that's where the topic of spiritual bypassing, and I don't know if I have time to go into that, maybe tomorrow, uh, comes in because <clears throat> we are <clears throat> instinctively, it's one of our basic it's instincts is to avoid pain, to avoid discomfort. So um, we use everything not to feel not even the slightest discomfort, not even talking about some really deep uh, hurt or wound in us. Uh, so just some restlessness or some boredom or some, some difficult feeling, even if it is not like a, a really difficult uh, experience, we try to avoid it. And we do anything to do that. Uh, we go to we we take the, uh, we we pick up the phone. We go to the fridge. We keep busy. Uh, thinking is uh, is one of the main strategies not to feel. And unfortunately, what we also do, and we all do it, we use our sp spiritual practice. We meditate on the breath. Uh, because, uh, I mean, th that has its value uh, if you can, uh, uh, if, uh, if we know why we do it and how to, how to do it. But even a simple breath meditation could be just one of the many ways to avoid how you feel. Okay. So healing trauma or healing karma has to do with learning to be with the discomfort and responding with love, with kindness, with care. That's it. It's, it's, it's very simple. I mean, it's not easy, but, but, uh, but that's the practice. Really, the medicine we all need and which we then pass on to others is loving awareness, is uh, learning uh, to respond to the discomfort, the pain within us with kindness, with care. That is not, that's easy said, yeah, but uh, part of this uh, could be, uh, for some of us, would be necessary to first explore how does it actually feel to be held? How does it actually feel to be cared for? How does it actually feel to be loved? And sometimes uh, it is necessary to experience that for the first time uh, by working with someone else. Yeah, being held in the sacred container of a therapeutic relationship or uh, in, the, in the container of a relationship to a teacher. Um, in the Tibetan tradition, one had, has also the possibility to do some of that. I mean, if we are not talking about really the experience of having uh, coming from a really dysfunctional family, then probably it's necessary to work with uh, a, like a, a therapist. But in the Tibetan tradition, when we talk about like the average developmental trauma, we have practices like uh, Tara practice or Shinrizic practice, so where we also go into a relationship 
uh, but we go into the relationship with these uh, projected angels of goodness. And um, we, uh, we can actually uh, get a sense of uh, that being held and being safe and being seen uh, through inner work. So, purifying karma, healing karma, healing trauma needs your promise and your commitment and your willingness to feel your pain, to feel the discomfort in your body. So that's another thing which could take some time for some practitioners uh, to actually become curious about the felt sense of the body. Particular what in the tantric teaching called is the emotional body or the energy body. So not only like the physical sensations, like the cause physical sensations in your body, but something more subtle. And that takes for some people I mean, a lifetime of trying to think your way out and a lifetime of disconnected disconnectedness of, of the body. It, it might take some exploration and some particular techniques to get yourself back to the body. But this, uh, this promise, this commitment to, to be willing and open to feel your feelings. Feel your feelings. Yeah, feel your feelings. And uh, in, in that, developing this confidence and this trust that you are actually perfectly equipped to feel all feelings. You were not perfectly equipped when you were three years old. So when you were three years, when you were three years old, you were not perfectly equipped to feel the feelings. So what what did you need to do? You need to you needed to develop survival strategies. And if it was an environment where you grew up, where there was hardly any. Uh, holding, being welcomed, being loved of, of, uh, for who you are, having space for your feelings, uh, then in order to survive, you had to develop coping strategies of disassociation, disconnecting from the body. So these coping strategies, they are not, uh, you know, they are not uh, bad. They are not evil. You know, so we should all bow to our coping strategies of disassociation because they help us to survive. Yeah. The same is with anger. Yeah. So they are, they are, uh, they are allies. Yeah. They help us to. To, uh, to go through this difficult period. But now could be a, the time to outgrow them. Because now you are, even if you have not realized it, you are an adult. <laughs> and, and, uh, particularly these coping strategies, they have not realized that you are an adult. So you really need to tell them. You know, because they they still feel that you are three years old. You are so you there's some part of us which is kind of locked in the past. So the same is with trauma, uh, with karma. So uh, in the when we are interested in this topic of what is sometimes called purification of of karma. So what we uh, what is necessary there that uh, to to uh, to work with triggers. So 
the people who trigger you, the situation who trigger you, they are precious because they point to where you are stuck in the past, where you have not, not moved on into adulthood, into being a more mature person. So they show that to you. And of course, since it's mainly the people we live with, and our children and our partner who crawl under our skin, they are like, I mean, they are, for a practitioner, they are really necessary. Uh, that's why it has a lot of value, of course, to do retreats and go into solitude and, and into silence. Um, that is uh, a valuable part uh, of our life as a practitioner, but it really, really has its limits. Uh, there's a lot of so-called ahats running around. They just have a huge shadow which they didn't look at. And it shows in the mess some of the so-called awakened teachers create about around them. Yeah. So being triggered in your life you know, as, a, as a practitioner is recognized as a valuable thing. And then learning to stay in that trigger without reactivity. Using different uh, the different instructions, there are different techniques and playing around. So how can I pause when, how can I pause with this initial pain of the trigger? How can I breathe with that in the body? How can I create a space around me, a sacred space where I feel supported? And one of the beautiful capacity we all have is to co-regulate. So you don't need to do it alone. That's why it's so supportive to meditate together because as a group, we always co-regulate. We help each other. Yeah, In this co-regulation, then happens um, also when you have a relationship to a teacher or in, in 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 a more therapeutic relationship. This the presence of other people create more space, so that there's more space for and and support for staying for staying with the difficult feelings. So there's a few uh, common, I mean, the teachings on karma and trauma, I said, I can see an overlap there. It's not the, exactly the same thing. Yeah. So, but, but there is an overlap. And one is karma and trauma, they are invisible. So you don't see it directly. Your karma shows in how you perceive things and how you react to them. Um, and your trauma shows in symptoms. And it also, both karma and trauma seems to have this, I don't know, this, this potential to draw us again and again into a similar situation. Actually, in karma, in the teachings on karma, depending on the school, the philosoph 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 philo philosophical school, you would almost sometimes you would say you actually create the situation, that the whole thing is a projection. Yeah? You wouldn't say that in the, in, in, the, uh, in the trauma teachings, but there is something that we are drawn to the similar similar situations, similar kind of people. Yeah? You can observe that probably in your relationships. Yeah, like you repeat things, you find yourself in similar dynamics, you create situations which if you reflect upon them, they remind you of your original family. Yeah? So there is that. And that is actually an instinct uh, because 
you get the opportunity to do something different. So difficult people in your life and difficult situations in your life can be actually seen, and that's what you would do in the Lojong teachings, in the, transfer, in, the, in the mind transformation teachings of Tibetan Buddhism, can be actually seen as opportunities. They, they, you are drawn to them because then you have the opportunity to respond to the situation in a different way than you used to. And you have the opportunity to feel the pain. And as I said before, what you want to heal, you need to feel. Otherwise, it stays dormant. Otherwise, it stays invisible. So as a practitioner, what we are actually kind of invite into our life is that that which is not healed in us yet, that it becomes visible. We invite it. We invite that. It's counter instinctual, of course. You know, that's not what our instinct of trying to avoid pain would, would tell us. So a second common uh, feature of the teachings in karma and trauma is it leads into disconnection. Yeah. Disconnection from, from people, disconnection from the body, disconnection from the environment. We disconnect. Yeah. As I said in the beginning, we are not in touch with present moment. We are disconnected. We live in our projections. The, the third common feature of the teachings on karma and trauma, or teachings on trauma, I don't know if you can say that, the research on trauma is it's relational. When we talk about karma, uh, we talk about relationships. When we talk about trauma, we talk about relationships. So that's why I don't believe that we can meditate our way through, out of this. Some people, some people uh, would say yes. Yeah, I ask some some meditation teachers, uh, but I I don't buy it. But that's my opinion. That's my opinion. We can't meditate our way out of this on our cushion by realizing emptiness or something like that. Finally, we don't feel our feelings because everything is empty or something like that. Karma is relational. Trauma is relational. So we have to work with others in groups, in relationship. That's our place where we purify karma and where we heal trauma. You can't do it on yourself, uh, by yourself. First, you can't do it by yourself because you need to be triggered. Otherwise, it remains dormant, yeah? it stays invisible. And you can't do it by yourself because if you are really disconnected, you need someone else to love you. You, you, need, to, you need to feel how it is and I said in the Tibetan tradition, there's these practices like you relate to Tara. There is a, some potential in it, but but I I actually I actually feel it's uh, it's a bit of uh, yeah it's good, but it's not the real medicine. So out of, to the way out of disconnection is has to happen in relationship. 
and take this lightly what I say yeah so I'm just maybe sometimes I'm a bit too confident yeah so I'm just saying this and then the fourth is um, really important uh, the work with trauma and karma is body work it's not conceptual So both uh, in in both uh, if you if you work with if you work with uh, uh, an experience of trauma, talking is not enough. It can be, of course, some intellectual intellectual understanding is um, is uh, is helpful, uh, and the same with karma. It's not uh, it's not an intellectual path, understanding karma and studying the laws of karma. And, uh, it is uh, something. It's body work. Meditation is body work, in the body. It's non conceptual. the The concepts they can help us, but the experience, the the healing, the the healing happens in the felt sense of our body. Okay, so is there any comment, any question? Yeah, that's uh, good. Uh, I just see, uh, what about the feeling that trauma happens to me because I deserved it? Bad karma, being a, being a bad person. Yeah, that's one of the uh, one of the examples on how uh, certain teachings uh, in the Tibetan tradition, particular that's the tradition I know the most, uh, because we hear them with our with our background, with our psyche, and then we hear um, we hear them in the way. Uh, so that it triggers feelings of uh, guilt and shame. Yeah. So that's um, that's something that's something really to be aware of. So whenever you listen to teachings, or you around a Tibetan a traditional Tibetan teacher, no matter if they are Western or a Tibetan. And uh, you hear the teachings in this way, so you feel guilty, ashamed, afraid, uh, you feel not good enough. Uh, be really aware of that kind of experience and yeah. Talk with me. <laughs> I can, I can, I can, uh, I can translate what is being said. Uh, you know, it's it's actually sometimes just a matter of translation, the words being used. Uh, but uh, it's so important to start to understand the back the background of the Tibetan tradition. Yeah, so it takes some time to. Uh, yeah, there's one problem, uh, one challenge uh, in that is that somehow we have the tendency to read this text uh, and uh, interpret them literally. Yeah, like, I don't know if I can really communicate that in a short time. Like, I mean, if you are, if you have, reflected on other scriptures like Christian teachings. Uh, 
then maybe you came to a point to understand that these stories and these teachings that they are on a metaphorical level, that, that they are analogies who come from a certain culture and have certain meanings there. So why are we not doing that with the Buddhist teachings? Yeah. What is actually, what is being communicated on a deeper level in these stories and into these teachings? For sure, the Dharma is meant to make us travel lighter through life, not more heavy, not with more guilt and more shame. So when we interpret teachings like that, uh, and we have this experience, then these teachings need to be interpreted in a different way. Okay, there's more to say to that, but uh, let's answer some of the raised hand. Claudia? Hi, I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit on when you were talking earlier about karma and our perceptions, you know, our perceptual filters, and then trauma symptoms. Could you expand a little bit more on that? Um, I, I, I guess I'm particularly interested in, in, yeah. in symptoms in the sense of like, were you, do you mean about physical symptoms, how they get somatized in a way, how the trauma gets uh, manifested in, in the body? Yes. I mean, physically, I mean, as, as physical symptoms, not just emotional? Uh yes as phys yes uh, so the, the, the suppressed the suppressed feelings so uh, trauma i mean there's different def definitions when we talk I, I use this word trauma kind of assuming that everyone has a kind of idea what i what i mean with it but one one way to describe trauma is something happens to you and which is perceived as life-threatening. So it doesn't need to be life-threatening, but it is perceived as, like if you left alone as a little child and your mother disappears and is emotional, not available, then that is perceived as life-threatening. And you can't feel that feelings. So your coping strategies are not, uh, are not sufficient to really feel the feelings. So what do you do? You suppress them, you disassociate, but the energy of them, they, they stay, yeah? And then, and so, and then if you go through your life, because we avoid pain, so we, we are not addressing, we, are, we, are, we, we are keep on disconnecting with the body, that, that initial wound stays and it might create symptoms, yes. It might make you sick. Yeah. So that's one one way to uh, start to work is um, where in your body do you feel, particularly when you are a meditator, where in your body, and you have meditated for maybe some years, where in your body do you feel some numbness, some tension which is almost always there, some discomfort? You know, some people, they never feel really comfortable in your body, in their body. That there's always something. It doesn't, doesn't feel good for them to be in the body. Uh, so, and instead of just ignoring that, and uh, not addressing that, and then in the end, it maybe uh, leads into uh, chronic back pain or uh, chronic pain in the shoulders because we don't listening to the symptoms. Uh, then to make this step and turn around and say, hey, I, I actually, it's actually possible and I deserve to be comfortable in this body. Um, but in order for for coming to the experience of that comfort, one needs to do the work of feeling what is there, 
unpacking it, making the invisible visible. Yes. Yes, uh, Shetsu. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, first of all, I just really want to thank you uh, for giving a language to, I think, what a lot of people um, are experiencing yeah. in, in terms of how we often weaponize the Dharma mm. um, to our own detriment. Mm. And so I could probably spend hours talking to you um, from based on my own experience of the last 35 years in mm. the Dharma, but I will spare you and the good people here. I you, would you are, can I ask you something? You are a nun, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, but you, yes. do you live in, in San Francisco? No, I'm in no. I'm in the United States. I'm in Iowa at the moment. Uh, I'm okay. yeah. I'm involved with caretaking my elderly mother. Uh -huh. But I but I was in the Dharma Center scene for a total. Yeah. Well, it's, it's I mean in this in the Dharma Center scene in terms of actually living um, within or close to a community physically for yeah. more than more than twenty five years. Yes, and mm. so there are so many facets and dimensions that I wish mm -hmm. to ask you about, but one of them is the, the question of um, how to address, so you know very well, you're familiar with the Tibetan teachings, you're familiar mm -hmm. with how Westerners tend to receive particular aspects of the, the teachings. For example, the really crucial one that I've gotten in trouble with is from the Lamrim, your perceptions are unreliable. And this is taught, of course, in relation to how we are to regard the spiritual masters. But mm. then what starts to happen is that you start to doubt all of your perceptions. And at least I did. Um, mm. And so one's own sense of north, one's own sense of uh, mm. what's authentic for oneself becomes violated over and over and i'm not i'm not sh shifting blame here i'm not mm. making anybody wrong i'm yes. just telling you how i have mm. done things mm. and so i would like to know well maybe this is in some way possibly connected with your own choice to leave the ordained life and i would like to hear maybe if you could address some part of that okay wow <laughs> Yeah. Or maybe we need a book, Awakening yeah. Through Trauma. Yeah, I think it needs a book. It actually needs a book, um, Trauma-Informed Dharma Practice in the Tibetan Tradition. I, right. I mean, that's right. now, I think there's a bit of, you know, Trauma-Informed Yoga, and also there's in some book about Trauma-Informed Mindfulness Practice. You know? That's right. It's, uh, but I'm not the person who, uh, who can write that book, or I'm not interested in writing also. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it's, um, yeah, thank you for just raise, arise, raising that question. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a bit like humbled now because I don't come up with a wise answer, you know, but just rising, uh, raising that question. Thank you so much because that's, you know, that's, uh, that's where we start as Western practitioner, yeah, to raise mm -hmm. the question and to, and to notice um, and to be honest, uh, uh, where, where as also as long-term practitioner like myself, where we run into traps, yeah, and where we actually got hurt mm. and kind of re-traumatized so that we can talk about this and explore so that so that the generation after us 
it doesn't need to uh, fall in that, so that they can fall into other traps. Yeah, I mean, more, <laughs> not the, yeah, yeah. I was in a way um, fortunate because um, I became a monk when I was 32 or something. And I already had uh, done the studies in clinical psychology. I already had done a training in gestalt therapy. So uh, I think I was a bit, uh, I, I, I I kind of I had some some defense mechanism or some protective me, uh, already in in me. So I mm -hmm. already uh, was a bit familiar with my feelings and with my needs, and um, so there was uh, you know. And I, I mean, my teacher was is Lama Sopa Rinpoche, and he is really like full on traditional i mean it's it's really difficult to to be in a relationship with lama sopa rinpoche and remain healthy inside yeah because mm -hmm. every all of that can can trigger yeah i will take that question with me should so okay. and, um, and see what happens and it would be also we don't have time it would be also uh, interesting uh to hear how you handle that yeah how how you find your way uh, to, <laughs> I, have, to, I haven't to, yet but i'll let you, you know you haven't <laughs> yet yeah <laughs> so, but that's i just that's, sitting with agony is probably the best way that i can uh, describe okay. it but yeah. thank you do you work one on one yeah. with people yeah i talk with people uh okay. yes uh, maybe we can have a, can, a session yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd appreciate yeah. that very I'm, much. I, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not a therapist. So I understand. I'm, I'm just a, a, like a fellow explorer as you. Yeah. So, yeah. and and then we can uh, explore these questions together. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And you Thank can you. find the contact on my website. Very yeah. good. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Yes, Eva. Yes, um, I, uh, I just want to say that I'm very happy to to uh, look into this issue as uh, I have been a Tibetan Buddhist for more than 40 years and I have fallen into the most of the traps mm -hmm. and I can I can really see the the point of not being good enough and also the point of you should love everybody but not learn how to love yourself before mm. or at the same time and also misunderstand a lot of things about emotion that you shouldn't, the emotion are disturbing emotion and you, yeah. no use of them. So, mm. so for me, that was a very important turning point some years ago when I went into a very deep crisis that make me feel the feeling very concrete for a year. And so I also very appreciate when you said that about Jesus became, I come to a point where I couldn't meditate more, I couldn't develop more, I couldn't actually be better in any way. So I have to surrender. And for me, it was to the feeling of grace. I have to go under the 40 years of Buddhist dharmic training to the ground of holy grace. And mm. from there, I could take it into the, the, the Buddhism and, and suddenly understand it in a new way. Mm. And in one way, my teacher had always been, for me, the expression of love, but, but the whole dogmatic Tibetan thing that's it really have to transform for me and, and and i'm in that process now and it's i'm very happy to to be there mm. yeah so i think extremely important how can we transfer the buddhism into the modern world with all our wounds and traumas and relational 
habits yeah. and longing. Yeah. That's the question, exactly. That's the question. And we are the generation who need to figure out that. Yes. Yeah. That's quite... Uh, and so many casualties on the way. I mean, you have no idea how many people I know who have a kind of dharma burnout and uh, had to stop to practice. And uh, fortunately, some are so wise, they stay away <laughs> from, from, the, from the dharma teachings. You know, they go to a, a teaching and they just they are like some healthy part of them really feels no this is not for me this is just like yeah fortunately yeah and and then are the, then are the ones uh, who really get uh, get hurt yeah. so and that's uh, not for for someone like me uh, really uh, yeah trying to pass on the teachings in a way that that, that you no know, the, the teachings they are so precious they, they are I mean we are so fortunate um, but we really need to translate them yeah Okay, so let's spread the positive energy of our exploration, let's say. Just raising this question, yeah? Just raising this question. Maybe you didn't get any answers or uh, I didn't talk about, you know, how to, about the healing part, you know, but just raising this, uh, this uh, being, becoming aware of this question this is really important, I think, and exploring this together and sharing uh, where we get hurt or what what is um, what is disturbing us and hurting us in the teachings we receive and in the practice we do. So let's share this the positive energy of this uh, into all directions. And I thank all of you for giving me this opportunity to uh, to be myself <laughs> and and share some questions. And yeah, I'm looking forward to explore more uh, tomorrow. And let's see. Uh, I would be also willing to continue a connection with the Dharma Collective. So let's see how that goes. Um, to get to know some of you. And thank you for Eva, Mikkel from Denmark, uh, who are here to support me, and Gabi from Austria, and Ra Rachel from, uh, from Austria. So that, that's really nice to have a bit of familiar faces between the Americans, yeah, like the European, <laughs> European support. <laughs> so thank you so much and uh, take care. Maybe see you tomorrow. Bye.